Okay, good morning, everybody. And welcome to the first out of two sessions for circular approaches to procurement um, with specific focus on the higher education sector in Scotland. My name's Mervyn Jones and my co-presenter, Bill Dadell, will be sharing time with you over the next two hours um, to present a, an approach on circular procurement and how it impacts on delivery of policy strategic goals in Scotland, but also how it actually enables more sound procurement decisions to be taken when looking at the role of procurement within the circular economy in Scotland. This project is part of a wider European project under the Interreg programme in the European Union, and it's a specific part of the Interreg programme for the North Sea Regions project. And effectively what it's doing is you can see on the map there is it's joining up companies who border on the North Sea and are looking at creating more joined up markets within the North Sea region and of course from our perspective here in Scotland this makes a, a lot of sense in terms of being able to to have better access more circular markets within the Scottish economy. So as I've said, this is the first of two sessions and the second session is going to be tomorrow. We're going to be spending about two hours today. Uh, there's going to be uh, some slide presentations, hopefully some interactivity and discussions in terms of um, the polls, uh, use of the chat function. And in terms of general housekeeping, what we would like you to do is to contribute to the discussion but please use the chat function uh, because that will be monitored and we will be using that to look at your points of view any examples that you have and also um, any questions that you've got that we can then start to raise as part of the discussion session at the end of the session. As you can see here uh, our intended audience is really looking at all of those involved within the procurement process. So we're talking about a procurement cycle here. We're not just talking about the focus on tendering and the initial purchasing function. We're talking about all the pre-tender activities going on beforehand. And also then, because we're looking at a circular approach to procurement, we're looking at the role that procurement plays in terms of use and ultimately the options for disposal at end of life. So when we think about that, we have quite a broad range of stakeholders and therefore our broad our audience is broad as well. Uh, and although the focus of the PROSA project, although the focus um, is on public sector, when we talk about procurement and procurement actions and circular economy, what we are actually doing is, is it's, it's talking about the whole economy. So it's a equal relevance to the supply chains, it's as equal relevance to the private sector and its procurement practices as it is to the public sector. And tomorrow what we'll do is we will follow this session up with another session specifying circular outcomes. So we'll be moving more from the conceptual than the theoretical, if you like, um, the methodologies and the techniques into the practical application and implementation of circular procurement, looking at procurement in terms of delivering sustainability goals. And the way that these two sessions um, form in terms of the learning outcomes, you can see on the screen now, the first session, we have three different strands, if you like, we have the what, the why, and the how. Uh, and as I said, this will be quite high level, focusing on the key principles, but essentially understanding how circular approaches and by that and circular procurement is an extension of sustainable procurement, which hopefully most of you are familiar with. Understanding why it's useful to think about the role of procurement in terms of delivering the circular economy, the benefits and the ability to align with national performance framework indicators and goals. And then the key bit, if you like, is understanding how you actually put this into practice. And tomorrow's session will be much more focused in terms of applying the hierarchy, looking at developing specifications, the role that tendering specifications, criteria, even evaluation, an award, and then contract management can actually play. So how to, to actually put this into practice. 
Um, and again, a bit that's often missed out when we think about procurement is really how to then monitor and report outcomes so that we can bring that loop back and actually see what works and how it's benefiting us in terms of organisations, in terms of sector in the higher education sector and also in terms of the national economy in Scotland and of course more widely in terms of the North Sea region markets which is what this project comes under. So this is the agenda over the next two hours we're going to have this what is circular procurement and I'll lead that what are the benefits of the outcomes and Phil will lead that and we'll go back to key principles and examples and then we'll open it up for questions and next steps. So moving straight away into the presentation, what is circular procurement? If we think about it in terms of the challenges, we have three pillars or three legs to the stool, if you like, and you'll be familiar with these in terms of sustainability. There's economic, challenges, there's social challenges and there's environmental challenges. Um, and you can see on screen, you don't need me to read these out, but uh, in particular at the moment, we have a global challenge, um, which is, and I'm not going to start with COVID-19, we have a global challenge, which is the climate crisis. We also have a shorter term, but very, very, very significant challenge in terms of recovering from the global pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic. But then coming closer to home, we have challenges facing around <clears throat> the regional growth, um, growth in Scotland, regional growth within Scotland, and also growth within the higher education sector. And all of those challenges have knock-on effects. We're thinking here and we're talking here about a systemic approach. We're talking about a system and when we talk about systems, we're talking not just about inputs and outputs, but we're talking about interactions. None of these challenges are challenges in isolation. So you know, if we're talking about a climate change challenge that has massive economic impacts, it has massive environmental impacts. If we're talking about unemployment and social challenges in terms of education, they also have impacts. So everything is interrelated. And therefore, when we're thinking about procurement and the role that procurement plays, it has an integrated approach. It has also a knock on effect in all of these different spheres. So rather than seeing it as multiple challenges, what we're trying to do is to switch that mindset on its head and think about looking at doing one thing, which is more sustainable procurement, which addresses multiple challenges. And if you've got any other challenges, by the way, if we go back to this slide, um, in terms of the discussion, if you want to put those into the chat function, um, we'll pick those up and we come round to the discussion at the end of the session. So these are just some that we've identified, but obviously if you've got others, then please put those into the chat function. Now, what we're looking for, I've, I've just mentioned that word system. Um, what we're looking for here is an integrated approach. And when we talk about sustainable procurement duty, and Phil will go into that in more detail, the, the, the duty that was under the 2014 Procurement Reform Act in Scotland, um, which requires contracting authorities to consider sustainable outcomes and to consider how to procure more sustainably uh, when they're going about their business. That links into the National Performance Framework, which is Scotland's way of actually defining its values for the 81 indicators, <clears throat> but also its way of integrating the values within Scotland with the Sustainable Development Goals. And of course, that all links in through legislation, through the Climate Change Act, and also through the Circular Economy Strategy, Making Things Last, which came out in 2016. And as I've just said, they all link back up to the sustainable development goals. And as I mentioned, in terms of the climate crisis to the UN Climate Change Conference in Glasgow uh, later on in this year. So all of these things are interrelated. And, you know, again, it, it's not to make it more complicated. It's just actually to show that by undertaking actions, it, 
the bottom end, if you like, uh, at the coal face in terms of the sustainable procurement duty, we can have impacts all the way through. So the smarter we are in terms of thinking about what we're doing in terms of our day-to-day -day procurement, the more impact and benefits that we're getting from our chain. And you can think about it, if you like, in terms of a golden thread through those national priorities. If we drill down into those national priorities, the 81 indicators, as I've said, including greenhouse gas emissions, the national strategies, um, for example, again, I've, I've mentioned um, making things last, you know, the circular economy strategy that focuses on specific issues within Scotland. And then we get down to more organisational sustainability strategies, for example, the APEX supply chain sustainability policy. Uh, so these are more localised strategies. And then how procurement acts as an enabler to actually start to deliver on those, because it's all very well setting policy goals, targets, indicators and strategies if we don't actually do something about it. And this is where procurement as a lever, as a mechanism or as an enabler actually then comes into play because it's something that we can control on a day-to-day -day basis and it's something that if used strategically can have very beneficial and positive outcomes but if we don't use it strategically by definition it then has adverse impacts in terms of the very things that we're trying to actually improve. So that comes through, as I said, to organisational sustainable procurement priorities. And again, if we talk about the higher education sector, you know, the needs of one particular college or one particular organisation in the higher education sector are going to be slightly different from the needs of others. So again, that has to filter all the way down. So it's, it's this golden thread that links all of these into the outcomes and then into the delivery of the benefits that then feed back up top level. And when we talk about a circular approach, hopefully you're all familiar with the concept of a circular economy, um, it, which is around closing material and product loops and retaining the economic value as high as possible within those loops in order that we can engineer economic benefits as well as environmental and social benefits in there. So when we talk about a circular approach, it's about if you like an extension of sustainable procurement, it, it's another way of describing sustainable procurement with a strong emphasis on that whole life cycle. Um, it's about maximizing the lifespan, it's about optimizing the functional life of products and making sure that materials are moved around within the loop as long as is economically viable and environmentally beneficial to do so rather than having leakage out of this system, out of this loop into waste, where it then requires replacement by virgin materials. So the key benefits, as you can see on the screen in front of you, are inevitably a reduction of use of virgin materials because you're keeping things in use longer and you're avoiding waste. So everything has a value and therefore it means that waste in one area then becomes a resource in another. All of that, of course, has a net impact in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And from an economic perspective, it improves resilience because it means actually that we're in a country like Scotland or in any of the other pro countries where we're net importers, that we can actually retain the materials that we're importing longer and therefore we can use the value and create jobs and ultimately save money. So I'm going to pass over now to Phil in terms of why adopting a circular approach and then he can explain a little bit more and I'll come back and speak to you a little bit later on. Over to you Phil. Okay thanks Mervyn. Okay Right, so good morning to everyone. Um, good to see you. Thanks very much for attending. Um, just following on Mervyn's point, hopefully you can see this slide, which is uh, now moving on to the why. So Mervyn's been talking a little bit about uh, what, it, what it means, what the circular approach to procurement means. Now let's spend a little bit of time just reinforcing the, some of the points Mervyn's made about the why this is important. Um, Mervyn's touched on benefits, outcomes, which is a critical element of this. And he's also touched on the sustainable procurement duty, which um, 
everyone in the public sector is, is probably pretty familiar with, but it's worth just reinforcing, <coughs> excuse me, what the duty uh, states. Obviously, we have a duty as a public body to improve the economic, social, environmental well-being of the authority, whoever you may be, your area, and act in a way to secure improvements identified. And that includes, therefore, a focus on uh, economic, social, environmental improvement, uh, the involvement of SMEs, third sector organisations, and also innovation in the supply chain. Um, now, all of these link to the circular economy, link to the circular approach to procurement, as, as uh, Mervyn has indicated. We'll touch on innovation later and its role in supporting the transition to a circular economy through procurement, because that's an important, important element of this. Um, so essentially what we, what we have within Scotland is the legislative framework <clears throat> that enables us and, if you like, uh, obligates us to consider how we can apply um, sustainability, certainly in the procurement process, but by the virtue of what Mervyn's just said, uh, also apply a circular approach to procurement. <clears throat> and an important element of this um, is emissions. Um, obviously, we have the Climate Change Act. Scotland has um, world leading, if you like, climate change targets from a government perspective, which are obviously enshrined in law. And the circular economy and a circular approach to procurement is one way of supporting uh, the transition to net zero. And, and how we address the climate emergency. Um, for those not familiar, there is the Climate Literacy for Procurers e-learning module, which the Scottish, Scottish Government launched at the beginning of March. Um, if you're not fam familiar with it or you've not viewed it, then I encourage you to do so. It's available from the Scottish Government Pools Total, portal, portal, portal on the Scottish Government website. Um, and as the module emphasises, um, an approach to circular economy and procurement is part of the way that we need to um, seek to reduce emissions from the supply chains. Um, if we just focus on operational emissions, the emissions that arise from the use of energy, uh, the use of transport, for example, um, then we ignore a significant chunk of emissions. Um, for example, embodied carbon, those emissions that relate to the products, the materials, the assets that we, that we buy, that we use, that we develop, that we build. Um, and there are certain categories of procurement where there are known to be particularly high levels of embodied carbon. And that embodied carbon arises from um, a focus on the manufacturing process, so the use of materials, the use of the generation of waste by the manufacturer, whoever that may be, or the developer in the case of um, assets. And um, we need to try and reduce those emissions because they can they contribute towards uh, a significant, they contribute a significant quantity or significant proportion of the total emissions that are generated. Um, for example, in embodied carbon overall accounts about 11% of global emissions and about 28% of emissions within the um, construction sector. And one of the key messages that this slide shows as a headline is that four-fifths of Scotland's carbon footprint actually relates to um, the supply of goods and services, um, the goods and materials that we produce, we consume and that we um, we often generate as waste. So from a life cycle perspective, 80% is quite a significant and, and stark reminder that uh, we really need to focus um, the 12.6 billion pounds or thereabouts that we spent or spent last year on procurement in Scotland. Uh, we need to mobilize that to reduce emissions in the way that we can. So it's not just a question of a, a focus on scope one and scope two, it's also a focus on scope three. So buying circular, um, which is what we're talking about, is key to reducing our demand for resources and, and also cutting our carbon emissions, while, as the sustainable human duty says, uh, supporting uh, innovation and investment uh, to de develop uh, alternative circular business models, perhaps, where they're relevant, which we'll be looking at a little bit later. 
Now, just to reinforce this point, we have a short video, which is Zero Waste Scotland video, which I'm just going to play now. Hopefully you'll be able to see and hear this okay. Eighty percent of Scotland's carbon footprint comes from the goods and services we consume. Take a chair, for example. In a linear procurement model, suppliers extract raw materials from the earth to manufacture a new chair. The chair is then sold to a customer and often has a short lifespan before being binned. Then the customer goes out to buy another new chair. We need a new model, one that reduces our consumption of new materials while benefiting buyers, suppliers and the wider community. Within circular procurement, we begin with the chair we already have and think about reusing or repairing it before buying another one. If we decide to buy a chair, we could lease it or buy one that's been used before. If we do buy a new chair, it would need to be made, sold, used, then either restored or remade into something completely new, then used again. This circular model produces less waste and less environmental impact by using products more efficiently. The circular loop benefits suppliers, buyers and the wider community in a number of ways. Suppliers benefit from increased commercial opportunities, while reduced waste and emissions mean less taxes and a healthier environment. Maintenance contracts mean longer term relationships with customers, while refurbishing products can help diversify markets and improve resilience. There are clear benefits to buyers too. It's often cheaper to repair than replace. Circular procurement enhances reputation, improves value for money and aligns with corporate responsibility. The wider community also benefits as repair, refurbishment and remanufacturing skills are developed, offering new training and employment opportunities in the local economy. The more people who buy into it, the more the market develops, the more benefits flow to the wider community. So how do we do this? First, we should make the most out of the resources we already have. And second, we can buy repaired or remanufactured goods or even lease them. If we must buy new products, they should be good quality, long lasting and produced sustainably. The earlier we consider whole life purchasing decisions, the more sustainable our consumption will be. So, next time you are considering upgrading or purchasing your furniture, fixtures or fittings, think circular. It's better for your pocket and the planet. For help and support on circular procurement, contact Zero Waste Scotland. Okay. Um, hopefully you found that, that useful. It's, it's um, obviously a short video, but it emphasizes some of the points we've been making um, and some of the benefits that um, have been highlighted by Mervyn that have been highlighted in that short video uh, <coughs> are reinforced on this slide. Um, applying a circular approach to procurement, which as Mervyn says is taking a strategic approach does offer a number of opportunities for economic, social and environmental improvement. And we obviously are in a situation, again, as Mervyn said, where we need to, to try and capture many of these. We have um, the Climate Change Act, we have um, quite challenging targets for net zero. Um, and the only way that we're going to achieve net zero is through transformation, is through innovation, uh, new ideas, as well as new ways of doing things. And part of that is about rethinking what we buy and how we buy. Um, we need to address the, the problem that has been caused by COVID. Uh, and if we, if we take, if we use procurement in the way that is possible, then these benefits are, are equally possible. Um, so when you're looking at the, the social aspect, and again, the video touched on this, <coughs> excuse me, um, it's about, if you think about the 80% of carbon emissions um, in Scotland relating to what we buy and consume, um, a chunk of that, a fair chunk of that comes from overseas, it's imported. And as we've seen with the, the circular economy approach to procurement, then there is the opportunity for more local jobs, more local skills, partly because you are changing the way that you procure, you're changing what you procure, 
and, and that opens, opens up opportunities. So effectively you're onshoring, if you like, and uh, you're addressing some of the social problems that we have, um, be that employment, be that uh, inclusive growth. And inevitably this, this therefore forms part of uh, an agenda which might include community wealth building or inclusive growth. Um, so it's an important enabling mechanism, if you like. So there's a lot of outcomes that are possible. Um, not all of them are necessarily going to rise with every um, procurement that applies a circular approach, of course. And uh, one thing I should stress, I think, from the video you've just seen, is it's not just all about furniture. We will be using furniture as one or two examples because that's a simple example to use. But um, it isn't just about furniture. It's about a whole range of different products, materials, assets. Uh, it can be construction, it can be computing, it can be a whole range of things. Mervyn later on will be looking at some of the key priority sectors, priority categories. Um, so don't assume it's just furniture. Okay, and again, as Mervyn said, if we apply a circular approach, it is a way of um, supporting the intended national outcomes that, uh, that we all have to, to try and meet, to try and support. Uh, the national outcomes, if you like, are a way of localizing the um, uh, UN SDG agenda in a relevant, relevant way. Um, so there are lots of benefits, lots of outcomes to be had. Now this, this particular slide shows you um, an example. It's based upon some information provided by, with many thanks to RIPE Office Furnishings. RIPE, again, this is furniture, but it gives us a, a simple, useful example to show um, some of the benefits that arise from a circular approach. <clears throat> um, now, if you take, for example, on the left-hand slide on this graph, that is a chair made from virgin resources. So it's a new chair using virgin materials. And on the right hand side, we have a remanufactured or refurbished chair. <clears throat> so that isn't using virgin resources as such. It might use a little, but it's, it's remanufacturing, re refurbishing, so that it's taking what would otherwise be considered a redundant chair and extending its useful life. And what this slide tries to do is to show you the. Oops, that's jumped ahead. Sorry, just need to go back. <clears throat> what this slide um, shows you is the, um, the benefits to be had, if you like, in terms of financial outcomes, economics. Um, if you take the uh, chair made from virgin resources, there are obviously materials needed to make the chair. There's labour involved. There are other overheads involved. And then there's the profit on top of that. To, to the manufacturer or the distributor. Um, on the left-hand side, you'll see the red line, which shows you the structurally lowest price for new furniture. And that is compared with the, the figures on the right. Now, what's happening on the right is there are less materials needed. You don't need virgin materials. There may be some, but much less. Um, the labor aspect, labor cost aspect is higher because you are getting involved in uh, repair services, refurbishing, remanufacturing services. Um, and, and okay, that's a greater cost, but if you look at the total cost uh, for the remanufactured, refurbished chair, it's much less, uh, about 30% less than the brand new chair. And the labor cost gives you an opportunity. It provides opportunity for more jobs, more local skills. So it's supporting the local agenda, the local economy and local development. So you're getting, if you like, a double whammy. You're getting financial benefit, financial savings, and you're also getting um, um, social improvement, economic improvement through local jobs and skills. This is um, another example that is kindly provided by Kinross Wooden Products. Um, again, it's looking at furniture, um, and it shows you the the breakdown, if you like, between the costs of a brand new desk 
and, and that of a remanufactured desk. And it shows you the breakdown in terms of um, the contract price. Um, and I think it's interesting to show that with a brand new, um, a brand new desk, you'll see that um, you have a number of organizations in the supply chain um, they all need to make a profit margin for this. So the cost is, is almost by, by default is going to be potentially higher. Um, profit margins can be potentially higher. Um, whereas the remanufacture, you are, um, the, the remanufacturing process will tend to take place more locally, um, as we've just said. And uh, you are ending up with a, a lower overall cost price, 65 pounds to 75 pounds. So, Again, that shows you an example of, of what's available. Now, these, these are, again, furniture as a stress, that's furniture is not the only category we're gonna look at, but it shows a simple example um, of you can get social value, you can get social improvement through the jobs and skills aspect. Uh, you can improve economic development in that way, which is critically important at the moment. And you, you can also save some money and reduce environmental impact. Obviously, that what this doesn't do is it analyzes the environmental improvement. This is just looking at from a cost perspective. But if you're talking to stakeholders who are concerned about your budget holders, um, which inevitably will be under severe strain, then that's an important factor, of course. So um, what we've got now is our first poll. And there's a few of these polls we're going to be running today and tomorrow. And what these polls will do, we'll ask you a, a question or two, and uh, we'll give you a, a minute or so just to, to respond to this. Um, so this particular poll is asking for your opinion. We have two chairs here. We have one chair, um, which is the Herman Miller product on the left. Uh, Herman Miller have been around for many years, you may be familiar with them, um, and it is C2C, which is Cradle to Cradle Certified. Okay, for those familiar with Cradle to Cradle certification process, um, there's various criteria for certifying a product for a C2C certified. Uh, material health, material re reutilization is one of the factors. So the reuse of parts and uh, products, recyclability, um, ease of disassembly. So that is a product that is designed to be repairable, easy to break down, easy to disassemble. Um, the one on the right is the, um, the famous Charles Eames. Um, cost a small fortune, of course, been around for many years. Um, and uh, you see them popping up on programs like the repair shop every now and again. Um, now they are designed for durability. They were built high quality, very expensive, um, made out of plywood. When they were first made, they were made out of rosewood, which obviously you're not supposed to use anymore. So they're not made using that. Um, Charles Eames stopped using that some years ago. Um, typically covered in leather. Um, but they, the, the main distinction between the two is one is designed for disassembly, for repair, um, reuse. The other is designed for longevity, durability. So the question is, which of these is more circular? Okay, so what we'd like you to do is to, um, if you wouldn't mind, just the pop um, a poll appearing now. So off you go. You can see some answers coming in. Okay, just give another few seconds. Okay, so looking at the results, thank you for everyone voting. Um, the winner 
if that's the right term, is the cradle to cradle task chair, or 72%. Um, believe that to be more circular, and 28% the child's age. Is that correct? Well, simple answer, there, is, there isn't necessarily a right answer to this. It depends in part on your um, what you're particularly focusing on. What are your ambitions? Are your ambitions to um, have something that is durable because it's going to be a one-off purchase that um, when you want something quality, it's going to last for many, many years? Um, is it going to be um, a chair that is going to have a, a lot of use and maybe get to the point where it needs repairing, in which case you need something that's reusable, uh, repairable, remanufacturable, etc. So we need to focus on uh, resource use, keep resources in use for as long as possible, extract maximum value while we can, uh, make sure we can recover materials where we can and regenerate. So we're closing those loops that Mervyn was, was mentioning. So we'll perhaps come back to this later, but um, the short answer is there is no necessarily right answer or wrong answer for this. They are both circular in different ways. One has a particular focus on durability, which is part of circularity, because if something is more durable, then it, you don't need to replace it. Um, you therefore don't need to use durable materials. What you do need to make sure, of course, in the, if that is the approach, is that the materials you are using are sustainable. Um, you are avoiding use of unsustainable materials. Um, and obviously we could get into a big debate about the use of plywood and the use of leather, et cetera, but um, you need to make sure that sustainability is a core part of that. Equally with C2C, then again, the materials used must be sustainable, but equally the design is very much about making sure that it's uh, ease of disassembly and reusability. Okay, so thank you for doing that, that first poll, interesting one. Okay, and uh, any comments on that, please feel free to put it into your chat. Um, always good to keep the debate going and discussion going um, during this session. Okay, so thank you for that. I'm now going to hand back to Mervyn, who's going to talk a bit more about um, how we apply this. Hi, Phil. Hi, Mervyn. Yeah, just a little bit of apologies, apologies here. here. Okay. Right. We've got a few IT <laughs> issues. <laughs> okay. okay. Do you want me to share? Uh, no. I, I, well, hopefully, let's let's just see about this. So, yeah, as as Phil was saying, um, really important here just to in terms of this session um it's not a workshop it's a webinar but we would like this to be as interactive as possible so i notice a couple of people have put some comments into the chat please use that chat function so that we can start to to get a sense of what your views and what your perspectives what your challenges are in terms of whether um what we're saying is actually making sense hitting a nerve um or you know, is is on message or however you want to call it. But um, what I'm going to be doing now is hopefully if I can get the, the IT to work a little bit better than it was on my other computer is to actually start sharing. And in order to do that, I need to find the presentation. <laughs> Okay, so how to apply a circular approach. <clears throat> the, the approach is, uh, the, again, the, the furniture example that we've just done the poll on, you could apply that to any number of categories within um, procurement. And yeah, when we talk about 
procurement within the public sector or procurement within the higher education sector or indeed procurement in the um, private sector. The, 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 the areas that tend to come out in terms of areas for action, in terms of areas that continually come up the highest level in terms of prioritization, are typically the same sort of areas and you, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to actually work out what those are likely to be you know in higher education in public sector in general and um, it's these are areas around the estate around buildings construction occupation facilities management reuse etc refurbishment there are also areas um particularly when we're talking about higher education around transport um and again uh, in pretty much any organization, ICT uh, and electrical equipment come up high on the list, as do food and catering. And again, uh, particularly when we're talking about uh, in the higher education sector, you can divide food and catering into direct food and catering into services that are provided for both staff and students, uh, but also in terms of conferences and meetings, you know, where it may not seem to be a particularly important part, but it comes out time and time again as, as being quite high on that priority list. list. I'm trying to move on. But I'm having some real issues here. So what I'm going to do, uh, apologies again, this, these things tend to happen in terms of IT. If I can ask Phil to share his screen and get Phil to move on. Um, is that possible, Phil? Yeah, we'll do moving. If, if you could just move the slide on. That'd be great. Lovely. So. What this slide, and again, this this first session is is as I said right at the very start, is is a little bit in terms of yeah you know, the the theoretical aspects of it, but if we think about the procurement process as a cycle, and I put this on a, a linear scale, but there's a whole series of stages going through from pre-tender through specification, tendering, contracting, into actual uh, ongoing contract management. <coughs> monitoring, servicing, and then ultimately, uh, uh, again, if, if we're thinking about product life cycles and we're thinking about procurement life cycles, ultimately there's an asset disposal stage. Now, more often than not, an asset disposal stage isn't part of the initial contract. But if you think about it from an organizational perspective, at some stage, somebody somewhere within the organization, whether that's your waste manager or whoever, then has to initiate a procurement contract for waste management and disposal services. So when we talk about circular procurement, we're talking about whole life impacts. And again, when we talk about whole life impacts, we're talking about whole life costing. And from an organizational perspective, if not from an individual budget holder's perspective, suddenly thinking about that, then and the impacts of that then become quite important. So the more that we can think about what those impacts downstream are at the beginning of the procurement process, at the beginning of that cycle, then the more likely we are to be able to monitor, manage and control those. You know, the, the, the classic Deming principle that you can't actually manage something that you haven't monitored. So Phil, yeah, if you could just advance the slide, please. And what you can see with this next curve on the on the graph is that when we talk about the procurement process, the degree to which specifications are fixed are no great surprise during stage two, the specification stage. <clears throat> but what that does is that creates a, a crossover point, which shows that within every bit, every stage before that, the the area that it for greatest impact um, is typically pretender. And of course, as anybody who's involved in procurement knows, this is often the area that is the most challenged in terms of resourcing, most challenged in terms of getting other stakeholders engaged within the procurement process, and is the most challenging in terms of actual then time intensity and doing something about it, not whether that's internal engagement or market engagement, understanding what the opportunities are. 
it is the area that is of most importance. And in terms of the, uh, the slide in front of you now, there's, there's actually guidance, there's plenty of guidance out there, not just in terms of sustainable procurement, but also now more broadly in terms of circular procurement. And this guide that's come out from the Dutch government, uh, Circular Procurement in Eight Steps, actually identifies and breaks down those stages in a little more detail. So it goes through these first five steps, which are effectively steps around pretender actions from definition to ambition, making sure that the ambition of the organization is actually reflected in the procurement. Is the procurement not just going to deliver goods and services for ongoing day-to-day -day operation, but does it actually deliver on the wider policy objectives, the strategic targets of the organization, and indeed the mission and the vision of the organization? And, and why is that important? Well, you know, it, it might not seem as important from the cold face um, as, as you'd think, but actually there's, there's a huge potential for risk. And often when we talk about procurement, we're talking about risk. And one of the key factors here is risk is, is in terms of doing something that has an adverse impact. Now that could be a reputational risk, risk, it could be an operational risk, a strategic risk, and we'll go into that in a little more detail shortly. But then in terms of internal organization, we're talking about defining the need. And again, classic procurement principles here, you know, challenging the original need. Do you actually need to purchase something in the first place? Um, from a carbon perspective, from a cost perspective, uh, and, and any other perspective you care to choose from in terms of resource efficiency, if you don't have to purchase something, um, and you can continue to reuse by optimization, by reuse or by refurbishment existing assets, then quite clearly you're having a massive beneficial impact and cost in terms of um, environmental impacts as well. It's also the pretender stage is the stage in terms of understanding what models are available. And by models, you know, we're being a little bit academic, I guess, in terms of the way we call that. But you know, what are the business approaches both you as a client and also your supply chain can offer and operate? And these vary tremendously already. You know, for example, we have um, paper use services um, for printing. Um, we have paper use services for um, energy, we have paper use services indeed um, in many other areas and you know increasingly now for example egg lighting in Glasgow we have paper use services for lighting so instead of actually owning the infrastructure if you like the the, the kit the luminaires the lamps the wiring um, and being forced into waiting for refurbishment cycles to come through if you're buying products as services and you're paying for the use of those, then you're able to have a much more efficient, cost efficient, but also a much more environmentally efficient service. And again, it's what opportunities exist in what categories that you can start to think about what different business models, what alternatives to simple ownership that you can actually employ within the procurement. And then of course, pretender, a key bit here is market engagement. Um, market collaboration, understanding what the market can offer you in terms of innovation and solutions, but also understanding and communicating to the market what your ambitions are, so that you're getting the best balance in terms of solutions offered from the marketplace. And then the last six we'll go into in much, much more detail tomorrow, so I won't dwell on those in terms of tender procedure, evaluation and contract management. But all of these are available within that book and that actually that book is free to download. It's not the only way of doing things, but it's a nice way of segmenting and looking at different opportunities within those sectors. Thanks, Phil, if you could just advance that on. So when we talk about setting circular ambitions, uh, if you can just move through this slide. Um, that would be great. Um, we talk about three phases fundamentally and again it comes back to the procurement cycle sourcing the use phase phase and end of life phase so looking at these aspects here um you know, again challenging the need do we really need it but 
asking some simple and fundamental questions, whether that's to internal stakeholders or to the marketplace, is do we really need it? Where does it come from? Who made it? What is it made of? And ultimately then, when we think about the use phase, asking questions about can we refurbish it? Can we repair it? How easy it is? What are the guarantees, et cetera, and so on and so on. Um, can we reuse existing items or can we purchase items that have been reused from the marketplace? Um, but then ultimately, when we think about end of life, what's going to happen to it afterwards? Is it designed for deconstruction? These are all questions that if we think about these early enough in the pretender stage, we can actually put these into the specifications, we can put these into market collaboration dialogue, and we can put these into the contracts in terms of better design um, for deconstruction and disassembly, as you see in the example in front of you. So yeah, if you could move on, please, Phil. So a circular approach is really not very different if you think about it from the waste hierarchy. It's about rethinking the need. It's about avoidance, if you like. So uh, yeah, if you could just advance this slide on, Phil, for benefit of time, place. Um, so satisfying the needs by making use of existing products. And I've just talked about this, making use, keeping products in their functional lifetime for as long as possible, optimizing that functional lifetime. And even where a functional lifetime is then um, finished, is then looking at the opportunity of remanufacturing. Uh, and again, a, a lot of this is not just about can you actually add that into the purchase of new equipment, but also it's about supporting new markets, engaging and diversifying existing markets. So supporting markets for recycled secondary materials, supporting markets that are trying to encourage reuse and that are trying to encourage remanufacturing. So there is that diversification. Again, it comes back to the resilience of the overall economy within Scotland. Then it's about reduction. Um, the next stage down, satisfying the needs by refurbishing existing projects, products. Again, it's this life cycle approach of thinking about optimizing the lifetime of existing assets. There's, there's a a phrase I'm not particularly comfortable with, but a lot of people use it, it's called sweating the asset. So making the most of that asset that you've already got. Then it's about reuse. And as I've just been mentioning, reuse is not just about making existing use, uh, re reusing existing products, but it's also thinking about the potential for your products. Can that be included in the procurement at the end of your first life of it? So where is it going to go to afterwards? Then we get into the actual procurement stages itself. Um, if we do have to procure new, making sure, like with the, um, the cradle to cradle products, making sure that they are designed and that they are built with sustainable materials, but also making sure that they can be repaired, that they can be put forward for remanufacturing and also for reuse once your organization has finished using them. And again, that's important because there is potentially there a residual value connected with that. So there's a potential revenue stream or there are social benefits in terms of donating you know, to third parties, to the third sector, the charities sector. Um, and finally, ensuring optimal use of products. Well, this has come through as a theme all the way through the waste hierarchy through the circular approach. It's about optimizing the use of products because fundamentally the energy that has been consumed, the carbon footprint within the product and the manufacture of those products is typically greatest uh, in terms of winning materials from the ground, manufacturing, distributing, and reselling and selling. So keeping those products as products for as long as possible before then thinking about the opportunities to recycle. Thanks, Phil, if you can move that one on and build the slide again for time purposes. So again, you will get copies of these slides and hopefully you'll be able to use these in terms of um, just information, maybe memoir, but circular principles down the left-hand side, avoidance, lifetime optimization, extending lifetimes, uh, through remanufacture and through design for deconstruction and disassembly, 
And then ultimately, when we're talking about circular economy, we're talking about closing these loops, whether they're product loops or whether they're material loops. And by doing that, not only is there the environmental benefit, but also as Phil was saying, you know, there's social benefits there because by and large, most of the closed loop operations, if you like, the re-economy, the bit at the end of first life, is done on a local or a regional scale. So it tends to benefit the local and the regional economies rather than the, the international supply chains. There are exceptions and it's, it, you know, it's, it's not a rule as such, but on the whole, there is a net benefit at the local and the regional scale. So it makes sense then in terms of closing those loops. Those are internal benefits you can see in the, the, the columns on the right hand side, and then there are the wider external benefits. And those wider external benefits are the benefits that then feed up into the national framework indicators, and they feed up then into the delivery of the sustainable development goals at a global level. Thanks, Bill. So if you can just move that one on. But of course, let's not forget, you know, we're talking about higher education sector here, we're talking about academic innovation, we're talking about innovation in terms of technical senses, but also we're talking about innovation in terms of product development, we're talking about innovation procurement in terms of processes. So <clears throat> yeah, when we when we talk about these innovative uh, opportunities, there are examples there across the bottom uh, um, in terms of creating and diversifying markets in the construction, in the infrastructure sector, the Mac Reba, plastic road you're introducing plastic and, and bio-based materials into infrastructure projects uh, to displace virgin materials but also to help in terms of product performance that bridge you see in front of you is the geelong bridge and that's been designed to be maintenance free for a hundred years in the netherlands they now have what they call circular bridges which are br modular bridges that are designed to be able to be taken apart and moved and reused elsewhere and even where they're not modular bridges the dutch are actually they now have an ebay version uh, an internal uh, product exchange site on their infrastructure uh, ministry that can reuse existing bridges so if a bridge is no, no longer fit for purpose in terms of vehicular traffic uh, for vehicles cars and, and lorries etc those bridges can still be used for cycling and for pedestrians so they can be uplifted refurbished and moved elsewhere and that has a net carbon saving and again you've got things like the k-brick and um, you know replacing virgin materials with waste materials so industrial symbiosis coming on here and again i've, I've mentioned in terms of lighting uh, i think egg lighting you know and looking at more circular business models so there's innovation in lots of different areas and again you know that fits i think very well with the with the overall vision and mission of the higher education sector uh, yeah, so the key here, collaboration, um, whether that's, well, not whether that, uh, and collaboration includes both internal collaboration and collaboration with the market. And I've said a lot of these points already, you know, if we're thinking about a systemic approach to products and services within the organisation and to the procurement process, by definition, it means that there are more stakeholders involved. And by definition, it means that we need to engage earlier at the pretender stage to make sure that all of those stakeholders have the ability to input. Um, there's no point in setting a waste management contract if you're not thinking about the actual people at the end of the pipe who have got to think about how to actually deliver that contract. So contract managers, and I know we've got a lot of contract managers on the, the webinar today. And again, with the market, not just to understand what the capabilities are of the market to deliver, um, not, and again, by market delivery, I'm thinking not just what they delivered last time, seven years ago, when we had either an ICT or a framework contract, but what could they deliver against your evolving and your, your ambitions and your targets? So it's about communicating those ambitions through market engagement to understand what the market can deliver and how it can help you deliver those policy goals. And again, the third aspect of collaboration is 
like we're doing today with the webinar, is actually peer-to-peer -peer collaboration. The best examples are examples from our peers, from whatever organisations, whatever institutions and colleges are doing, how they're doing it, because they typically have the same sorts of challenges. Thanks, Phil, if you could move that one on. So now what we're going to do is move to another poll, uh, and this poll is going to come up in a moment. Do you have the right internal people? There it is in front of you. Do you have relevant, sorry, the relevant internal people, for example, commissioners and specifiers involved in the pretender stages? Is that a yes, is it a no, or is it a, a don't know? And then the second question there is, do you routinely engage with the market in order to and you can answer as many of these ones in the second question as possible. And then please scroll down because we have a third question. How often do you engage with the market on these aspects? So three questions. Please use the voting buttons and also please put any thoughts or comments that you've got into the chat function. And just a note to Phil, uh, Phil, you should be able to see the polls coming up and you're probably going to be in charge of when to close the poll. But let's let's have a minute or two on this because there are three questions. Um, you can only see it as a, a series of questions. I'm not getting the responses can, coming in. I can certainly see the responses moving. How are we doing, Phil? Doing? We're still getting a few more coming in, Mervyn. Getting some answers coming in, Philip. Yeah, yeah, almost done. Okay, that's probably the majority we're going to get. Um, okay, so. Okay, so there we go. I'm seeing this in real time exactly the same as you are. So, do you have all the stakeholders? Approximately 50% say yes. Um, but again, you know, a sizable chunk of people who, and again, this is important because, you know, it's not trying to sort of say, right, need to do something about it but it's it's being aware it's going to change on a procurement on a tender by tender basis but um the key when we're talking about delivering procurement more strategically and when we're talking about linking it to delivery of um the national performance framework indicators and also circular benefits is about getting those stakeholders on board so you know if that's an action to take away please take away that action about <laughs> excuse me, engaging with internal stakeholders. Again, um, absolutely brilliant, communicating ambitions and future needs to the marketplace. Um, I don't think I've ever seen a poll as strongly favourable as that, which is absolutely fantastic to see. And if I can scroll down. Again, um, a reasonable percentage saying often in every relevant tender. So uh, again, that's good. Um, as we would expect with the forward thinking sector like the higher education sector and a forward thinking uh, government like Scotland. So I would hope that that is reflected in other sectors. We're gonna be doing these workshops in other areas within Scotland. So it would be interesting to see in a non-competitive way, how that actually pans out across other sectors. That's brilliant. Thank you very much for taking that. And if Phil could move on the slide, I think we're just about ready to, to move forward. I'm going to gloss over this one because we are actually going on over time. So again, just thinking about different um, functions, whether in different categories, it's going to be about looking at the whole life cost versus the impacts of that particular category. Uh, so let's move on from this slide, Phil, just for ease of time. 
Okay, in which case I think it's me now, Mervyn, isn't it? No, no, it's not, it's you, sorry, last one. And finally, in terms of prioritizing effort, again, um, you know, when we talk about the, uh, the, the matrix that you see in front of you, uh, particularly in terms of engaging with the marketplace, we, what we've got to remember also is that the market and different, the supply chain, if you like, in, in different categories, different sector, is not necessarily at the same level of maturity. Um, equally products, when we look at different categories in terms of procurement are at differing levels of complexity. And so this is a useful way of actually looking at, you know, um, in more detail in terms of procurement uh, approaches, looking at whether to ask technical questions or whether to ask functional questions, typically the higher complexity and the more mature the market, the more functional question you can ask, whereas the lower maturity of the market, for example, packaging, or the lower complexity of the product, the the more you can focus on technical specifications. And you know, in many ways that should be self-evident, but we potentially go into that in more detail tomorrow when we're talking about how market engagement. And um, but you can see examples in in pretty much all of those boxes there in terms of maturity and complexity. So again, as Paul indicated on relevant tenders, it's it's about looking at what is relevant for that particular tender um, and different approaches are relevant in different categories and you know for different types of product okay thank you if you could move on phil okay so i'll take over from here mervin so i think is this over to you now this is over to me yep yeah. um okay Right, okay, thanks very much, Mervyn. Um, hopefully our technical issues are resolved, but uh, any problems do let us know. <clears throat> okay, we're gonna look at uh, one or two examples um, briefly. Um, it's worth having a look at what's been going on. Before I mention some of what's on the slide, um, it's worth reiterating that this ProCERC, um, part of the Interreg program, is, is focusing on pilot um, projects and we have been supporting public sector bodies in Scotland for the last, not to remind me Spell how long it is, but it, uh, it seems like quite a long time. Um, yeah, about, yeah, it's about from kind of, uh, of 2019. Yeah, thank you Spella, yeah. Um, so it's getting on for 15 months or so, um, 20, 20, 24 months or so. Um, and we've been working with various organisations across the public sector in Scotland. Um, and the types of uh, procurements, contracts, frameworks that we've been looking at include uh, construction frameworks, it includes hard FM contracts, um, it's included playground equipment, um, slightly different one, but quite interesting, um, and, and various others. So, um, it's, it's been interesting working with um, public sector bodies who are particularly interested to, to better understand and to be able to apply this in practice. So as Mervyn said, the, the session tomorrow is very much focusing on that practical aspect. Um, but just um, touching on what we're talking about here, um, the, the example Mervyn referred to on the previous um, slide or a couple of slides ago, the Geelong Bridges is an interesting one because um, when Mervyn was talking about innovation, one of the things regarding innovation and potentially the circular economy is whether, whether there is an unmet need. You may have a particular problem, a particular challenge, which perhaps at the, mar at the moment the market can't currently meet. Um, so you need to um, clearly articulate what it is that unmet need is and um, and what your particular concern is. The Geelong one um, interestingly started from a focus, Mervyn said that they were 100 year maintenance free, uh, started from a financial focus. The financial focus was that Geelong, um, city of Greater Geelong was spending half a million dollars a year 
on maintaining their footbridges. And they didn't want to spend half a million dollars a year on maintain, maintaining footbridges. So they wanted an alternative. And at that time, there was no um, design of footbridges that would enable that. So it's a very much a question of going to the market and saying, this is our problem. This is our unmet need. We want you to come up with solutions. So it's, it's having that initial dialogue, enabling the market to think of some ideas and to, to help fashion, if you like, the specification and then go to open tender. And this ended up with a circular solution. You ended up with um, footbridges which are fully reusable, recyclable at the end of their life. <clears throat> and, and it's also generated um, uh, work for SMEs in the Geelong region and collaboration between Deakin University and, and other organisations within that region of Victoria. So it's, it's quite an, okay, it's an Australian example, but it's quite a good example from that perspective. So you're starting off with a financial problem and you end up with solving that financial problem and a circular solution. So other examples um, that we have on this slide, uh, Scottish procurement, obviously we're talking about frameworks here and um, the construction frameworks that we've been supporting, there's been a focus on uh, innovation within that part of enabling the benefits to be achieved, the outcomes to be achieved through a focus on circular approaches to procurement will require some innovation in some cases. If we want to achieve net zero, and if we're talking about net zero, not just from a operational uh, emissions perspective, but embodied carbon perspective as well, which we need to think about that from a construction perspective, certainly then we're going to need some innovative solutions. Um, I think it's perhaps foolish to assume that we can um, achieve net zero in the timescale necessary uh, without some new ideas, without some new solutions. What we mustn't do is just default to um, thinking, well, we can just offset the problem. Offsetting is the last resort and always should be the last resort after we've mitigated what we possibly can. Um, the ICT client devices frameworks, so obviously that covers things like laptops, um, mobile devices, etc. Um, and the Scottish, Scottish procurement have been introducing circular approaches to that for a number of years, and they've developed a bit over time. Um, you have, obviously, in the ICT market, and obviously in the HEFE sector, you'll be familiar with this, you have um, the, the ICT market if you like, dominated the hardware, dominated by the likes of HP, Dell, Lenovo predominantly. And um, they have done some good things on making their products more sustainable. Um, HP, for example, you've got some of the, okay, a limited amount, but some of the um, elite products include ocean plastics. And um, most ICT companies have made a big inroads in reducing the energy consumption of their devices and also recy increasing recycled content in devices. So there have some, been some good areas. One of the big issues within a framework um, is how the public bodies who buy off that framework, be they universities, colleges, local authorities, whoever, what they do with the devices at the end of their life. So how do we ensure that those devices we can extend the value, the useful life of those devices. And it's not just necessarily a question of um, defaulting to a, a we recycling contract, so you think you do, you finish with them. There is um, a proliferation nowadays of free um, we recycling contracts, or there's a start of these appearing. And why are they free? Um, no charge no cost re recycling contracts because the provider knows that there is residual value to be had in those products. Um, and the ICT devices, client devices framework was very keen to try and um, maximize the value um, by extending the useful life of devices. So um, whether that's HP and the use of the Erskine plant for HP Enterprise, or whether it's their use of or their partnership with Capito, 
um, the Scottish SME, um, who also extend the useful life, organizations like Retech, uh, you may be familiar with. So we have some good businesses in Scotland who are able to um, extend the useful life, reuse devices, resell devices, and typically at least 80% um, at the Erskine plant or similarly Capito and Retech, 80% of the devices that are passed to them, having reached notionally anyway the end of their life, are capable of reuse, be they the components or be they the devices, and some of them will go on for resale, and some of that resale value will come back to the, um, the previous user. So you are um, reducing the need for virgin materials because you're extending useful life. Um, you are saving money because you're potentially avoiding the need for some of the that we recycling costs. You may get some money back from the resale value. Um, so there are that, that's a particular area that's been focused on within within the ICT de devices framework. Um, NHS Scotland and uh, circular furniture services. Now um, this goes back almost two years um, when the framework for office and mental health furniture was coming up for reletting. And um, there was a particular ambition uh, for NHS Scotland that they wanted to have a high focus or a strong focus on circularity. Um, and it ended up with 25% of the weightings applying to circularity. Um, now, to get to that point, there needed to be a clear understanding whether the market could achieve um, those outcomes. What was the market capability and capacity for circularity? Now, the furniture market in Scotland, um, where you have um, third sector organisations, you have SMEs, you have large organisations, some of them are Scottish, some of them are English or Welsh, um, who are potentially interested in, in, this, in this framework. Um, and there was uh, initially a, um, a pin was issued to set out the, the objectives to try and get some feedback. There was a market engagement event when the ambitions were set out. Um, and it was an opportunity to find out from the market firsthand what was possible. It was an opportunity to send a clear message to that market saying, this is the direction of travel, this is our ambition. And we recognize that some of you may not be there yet or may have some issues in terms of your business model, but we encourage collaboration. We encourage you to talk to partners here or others to come up with a solution. And we would like to transition to more circular services during the lifetime of the framework. So it was trying to be proportionate it was trying to be ambitious, trying to get that balance right. Um, and as I say, we ended up with a, a framework where 25% of the weighting was, was on circular services. <coughs> Excuse me. Some of the European examples, and there are a number of them because um, Europe, um, the Dutch in particular, but not just the Dutch, have been particularly uh, vocal and um, strong in their approach to circular procurement. Um, Mervyn's uh, mentioned the, the guide, the uh, Circular Procurement Guide. Um, the Dutch government has had a, a particular focus on this and the National Furniture Category Plan exists. Now this is essentially saying that pres preservation and, and the value of materials needs to be guaranteed. Um, we want to purchase as little furniture as possible. And if we do, we, we procure those in a, if you like, a future-proof way. Um, now, there are some similarities to some organisations in Scotland, Perth and Kinross Council, for, for example, for some time, um, quite a few years ago, and it's been a case study for many years, has um, uh, focused on their procurement of furniture and alternative ways and looking at whether they really need to, to, to procure furniture or not, and, and ended up reducing their procurement of furniture quite significantly. And obviously, if you reduce the procurement need, then you are delivering something more sustainable, reducing costs, etc. etc. So 
Um, looking at it from a hierarchy approach, do we really need to buy? Is there an alternative way of doing this? Now, obviously, in the in the middle of a pandemic, um, office furniture is a, a subject of much debate, um, and there are there's a lot of discussion and focus at the moment on um, looking for services which can take what were otherwise uh, pieces of furniture within offices, within public sector offices, and making sure that they are suitable for domestic use where people are now working from home. Um, so there, there, is a, there is a need to make sure that what could be a surplus of furniture doesn't end up, just end up being a landfill or going into waste, but it has residual value and turning that into something that um, um, can be extended, can continue. Uh, I mentioned Kinross Wooden Products, Kinross Wooden Products for many years, and they have a relationship with a number of local authorities in particular. Um, will take furniture, remodel it, cut it down to a different size, shape, um, format, which is now suitable for reuse. Um, so the, that is creating jobs in Scotland, that's creating skills in Scotland. Uh, the Centro region that for Portugal catering very briefly, again, this was taking a collaborative approach. It was a, a smart uh, partnership, if you like, uh, focusing on circularity, making sure that circularity and procurement was a public priority uh, for public procurement. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, supporting this, there are tools and there are standards that exist. Now, part of circularity, and we'll probably touch, well, we will touch on this again tomorrow. Um, looking at the, the images down the bottom, firstly, there are a number of standards that exist that are sometimes used when it comes to considering trying to embed sustainability um, within procurement. You have things like EPEAT, Green Public Procurement Criteria, Cradle to Cradle Certification mentioned earlier, EU IKEA labels, and of course, government buying standards as well. And they will include potentially some element of circularity in there. There may be a focus on reuse, there may be a focus on recycled content, um, uh, minimum amounts, for example, to uh, minimize the use of virgin materials. Um, so it's important to understand what standards exist and what the underlying criteria behind them are, making sure that they're independently verified and audited um, to see whether they are suitable in meeting some of the, uh, the technical requirements that you, um, you're looking for. And as, as Mervyn mentioned in terms of the technical specification, there are other tools and ver verification labels that exist, FSC, other eco labels, etc. Um, and we're not going to go through this in great detail now, but some of these are um, what we're not saying here is you must use all these tools. What we're saying they may be worthy of consideration. There is a toolbox that exists, which we can provide the link to, uh, which is effectively a, a research of all the tools across Europe that are potentially useful and which some organization are using. Now they have to reflect your particular situation, the Scottish context. They have to re reflect your policy objectives and your particular policy regarding the use of tools, etc. So it's worth viewing these. Um, there are one or two examples. The Dubo Calc is a is a, um, a Dutch tool that is a way of monetizing carbon uh, and is being used as a way of differentiating. Um, um, options offered by uh, bidding organizations in tenders. Um, it may or may be not be something worth using it, looking at, but uh, I'd encourage you to do so. In Scotland, of course, we have sustainable procurement tools. We have the prioritization tool, we have the sustainability test, and we also have the life cycle impact mapping as part of the sustainability test. Um, and they're all available from the Sustainable Procurement Tools portal on the Scottish Government website. <clears throat> and obviously you, the HEFE sector, has taken these, has adapted them, uh, has evolved them to some extent to suit uh, your particular objectives, which is fine. Um, so we do have tools in Scotland that are 
um, are useful, are relevant, and can be used to support a circular economy. So in some cases, it's not a question of um, reinventing the wheel, it's a question of using what would exist in the most efficient way possible. Okay, so one of the issues um, I think is, is making sure where you want to focus effort. Um, you know, what, what are your ambitions regarding circular approaches to procurement? Um, do you want to make a step change? Do you want to be transformational? Um, are you looking to address all these issues on this slide and therefore be transformational? Or is it best to focus on something, um, one of these as, a, as a, a, a way of piloting, of testing an approach you of course must be relevant and proportionate. Um, two favorite words, relevant proportionality. It's got to be relevant and proportionate according to the size and the scale, the subject matter of the tender. Um, so whichever approach you take, whether you want to be transformational and therefore be more strategic in your approach, looking at whether you actually whether what you typically buy is the right thing to do, or should you be looking at delivering the function in a better way? And that involves tearing up the rule book, if you like, and rethinking your approach, <clears throat> or whether you want to focus on particular issues, um, a focus on recycled content with, within products um, or materials being used uh, within construction, for example, uh, a focus on extending um, the uh, opportunities for reuse and ex therefore extending the, the value of products and materials, etc. So make sure you, you know where to start or um, understand whether you're going to take a step-by-step -step approach or um, be much more transformational. Either, either is right, there's no right or wrong answer to that. Okay, um, just one example, again, furniture, and I keep saying we're not gonna focus on furniture all the time, but this is just an example reinforcing some of the previous points. Um, Malmo, city of Malmo has ended up with a furniture hierarchy. It really, really reinforces some of the points made uh, regarding the Dutch example and what we've spoken about before, uh, Perth and Kinross, et cetera. So um, do you really need to buy furniture um, if furniture is there, can it be renovated? Uh, making sure you're keeping an asset register so you know what's available, what its condition is, can it be repaired, can it be refurbished, can it be reused? Um, if you are going to buy brand new furniture, then apply circular principles to it in terms of making sure it's made of sustainable materials, is um, designed for durability, repairability, ease of deconstruction, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And just touching on the point um, that Mervyn mentioned regarding asking the right questions, <clears throat> according to the complexity and the maturity of the product um, or the, the market, um, will determine the extent to which you focus on, potentially focus on technical or uh, outcome-based or functional uh, specifications. Um, again, we'll be looking at this in more detail, but um, the more complex the product is, if you like, the, the distinction between the, the knowledge base, the understanding between you and the supplier will be, could be relatively wide. Um, so the more complex the product and the more functional your question can be, because you're looking for the, the supplier to come up with ideas, um, to propose solutions, if you like, because they are the ones who, who understand, who have the solutions. Um, We'll talk tomorrow about evaluation and the importance of being able to effectively evaluate, evaluate, sorry, effectively evaluating responses you get. One of the issues with evaluation, of course, is um, do you have the confidence to be, a, to, to be able to evaluate um, functional or outcome-based specifications where you are offered different solutions? And it's, it's important to focus on criteria, it's important to focus on the outcome so that you can do that. Again, we will touch on that tomorrow. Um, similarly, with maturity of the market, uh, if the market is fairly mature, um, the more functional, again, your questions may be. <coughs> Just 
the skim over that and the, uh, so coming towards the end so in turn this is this is an interesting example because this is again another dutch example um construction project looking at the supply and use of asphalt for roads and there were various um options offered if you like and they were from suppliers with different distance from the um, where the work was needed and different solutions so reduction in the amount of asphalt being used recycled content low temperature traditional asphalt etc etc now which is the most circular and which has the lowest co2 emission if you're just presented with that information you'd probably find it very difficult to do that analysis so you need to understand you need to have a set of criteria that you can evaluate you can uh, do the analysis to compare um, the approach that um, the dutch took on this was to use the monetizing of carbon approach to be able to compare like with like if you like um, now that may or may not be an appropriate uh, approach that you want to take or Scotland wants to take, but um, it is an approach that worked for them. Um, the important thing is understanding from, from day one what it is your intended outcomes are, what it is that the evaluation criteria therefore need to be so that you can objectively, without fear of challenge, um, evaluate responses. Okay, and um, final poll here is really asking you a question. Um, we've emphasized the point about circularity and life cycle assessment, making sure the whole life cycle is being considered, not just sourcing phase, not just looking at uh, um, where you're going to buy from and what you're going to buy, but also its use in the end of life. So the the Oh, really is a, is a question around that. Are you focusing on just sourcing or, or use of end of life? So if we could have that poll, um, there we go. So which aspects of the product life cycle would you consider in pre-tenders and tenders? Um, it's multiple choice, so select as many as are relevant for yourselves, so if you wouldn't mind doing that. Give you a few seconds to do that. Okay, I think in the interest of time, almost there anyway, so in the interest of time, I think we'll stop that now. So results, you can see the results. <clears throat> okay, so to some extent reflects the outcomes from the previous poll. 80% um, of you looking at sourcing in the end of life phase. Interestingly, less in the in-use phase, um, the utilization phase, it's an important element of this. Um, circularity, so that may be an area to be to be looking at. Um, but no, that's useful. Thank you very much for that. Um, okay, we have Okay, so oops, just going to finish off with um, this evaluation award. We need to I've mentioned the point about evaluation award. Um, award criteria must, of course, relate to your ambitions. Um, we need to get the balance right between technical specifications, outcome or fu functional specifications. Um, whenever we're developing a tender, we, we really need to know what a good response should look like. We shouldn't be scratching our heads when a tender comes in and struggling to understand whether it's a good response or not. Uh, so we need to have a clear set of criteria a clear understanding and of course weightings are important um, applying the right approach to what extent is circularity core to the subject matter of the contract and therefore needs sufficient weighting for example um, as part of the quality element um, 
innovation um, is part of that. We would certainly strongly encourage um, that you do not have added value as a sort of add-on question at the end of tenders, uh, which may incorporate innovation. Innovation it should really focus on the particular themes that you're concerned about. If you're concerned about reducing, um, making sure that the product or the service that we're talking about is being delivered in the most efficient way, then part of that may relate to the use of materials, may relate to the minimization of waste, and part of that therefore relates to potential innovative solutions that the, that the bidders may have. So relating it um, in particular to, to the uh, specific criteria is important to me. And of course, purchasing and managing is important, making sure that we manage contracts, making sure that we monitor what is, um, needs to be monitored, what are the relevant KPIs that we need to focus on, um, and uh, how are we going, what needs to be reported internally and externally, that's particularly important. And making sure that those responsible for contract management, and of course, in some organizations, uh, particularly HEFA sector, sometimes where um, procurement and contract management may not necessarily be undertaken by the same person, or you have devolved procurement to some extent, we need to understand, everyone needs to understand from day one what it is that needs to be monitored and managed, and how it needs to be measured uh, and then reported. Uh, this is an example uh, from Swansea City Council. I'm not going to go through this in great detail, but it's an example of the monitoring that took place, the reuse and remanufacturing of particular furniture items, reuse of carpeting, emissions reduced, uh, as well as the local jobs created, etc. So that's an example of some very clear KPIs were set and how they were monitored and reported on uh, in contract management. Okay, so that's that's the end of that session. Um, just about on time. So what we plan to do now is to to have a bit of a discussion. So um, obviously, hopefully, we've been having some uh, more chat coming in and some more questions, comments, and we're going to reflect on some of that, and um, and then have a bit of discussion for the rest of the day. So please feel free to keep firing in any questions or comments and the rest of the remaining time we've got left and we will try and deal with, with um, as many as we can, certainly the interesting ones. Um, Mervyn, Spella, have you been had a chance to have a look at what's been coming in? Yeah, there was an interesting point that Liam um, made earlier on. Um, uh, we said we also need to consider, you know, the, the structural financing, if you like, within organisations, uh, the difference between capital budgets, capex and opex, operational budgets, uh, and therefore some business models, um, products as service, for example, aren't necessarily possible. Uh, so, yeah, that's that's a really important point to bear in mind. Obviously, it's, it's yet another structural barriers, if you like, a yet another type of challenge, another type of barrier. Um, it's not that it can't be overcome, but yeah, you know, there are quite clearly difficulties in trying to become more circular when the processes, the systems, and the framework is set up to be very efficiently linear. Um, but there are ways around that, you know, and, and again, there are examples in many categories of where products as services can be done. It's not to push products as a service as the only business model option. It's just to, again, highlight and, and focus on opportunities to think about differences other than simple purchase ownership and then disposal, that, that take, make, dispose linear model that uh, the Alan MacArthur Foundation talks about so much. But I don't know if you, Phil, have got any further points on that, but definitely a very valid point. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, yes, I, I think I think the we will be talking about alternative uh, business models tomorrow in a bit more detail. <clears throat> um, but it's worth just touching on this because certainly from a financial perspective, um, 
there is, uh, you know, sometimes there are discussions around leasing and though that we should be leasing rather than buying. Well, um, two things with that. Firstly, there's a different financial model, of course, and um, you therefore need to make sure that there's clear understanding whether that financial model is acceptable or not, uh, whether that's your finance manager or director uh, influencing that. But equally, a lease model on its own isn't necessarily a circular approach, it doesn't necessarily deliver the circular outcomes. Um, okay, the ownership stays with the supplier. Um, are you, however, certain that they will deal with the product or the equipment or whatever it is that they are supplying in the way that you want them to deal with it, with it from a circular perspective? So are they um, maximizing, extending the useful life of those products in the, in the way they, they should? If they retain ownership, you would hope by default there is a financial incentive for them to make sure that they do so. But you do need to make sure that that is the case. Yeah, absolutely. It's, you know, again, a key point Phil's making there is it's not necessarily just about offshoring. Uh, in a similar way, you know, in terms of carbon offsetting uh, is, isn't necessarily an answer. Um, but, you know, picking up, um, well, linking to my own point there about carbon, you know, a, a good example here is, is the, the role that procurement plays in terms of the emissions, the overall carbon footprint of organisations. A lot of organisations have got uh, a very good handle on their scope one and scope two emissions, but, uh, you know, they're, they're not as detailed in terms of understanding of, of what their scope three emissions are covering. And when we think about scope three emissions, um, <clears throat> typically procurement accounts for anything from 60, even upwards of 80% of total emissions. Um, you know, so you, and, and scope three emissions themselves account for around 60% of overall organization. Again, it varies depending on the organization, but um, you know, figures from both the public sector and also from the higher education sector elsewhere you know, show the importance of scope free emissions within the overall carbon footprint and they show the importance of procurement within scope free emissions. So again, starting to focus on how your procurement actions can help impact on things like carbon reduction. Um, you know, again, help to make that case, uh, picking up on the point that Leanne made about, you know, structural financial barriers, helping to make the case about whether there is an argument to actually start to look to restructure finances within their organisations, but also, as Phil was saying, in terms of different categories, is the opportunities and making sure that those opportunities are relevant to the tender opportunity in front of you uh, and also proportionate, as you said, because, um, you know, just because leasing is, is an option, it doesn't mean it's an option in every case, but at the same time, it doesn't mean it should be discounted in every case. So again, it's, it's that need to look at it on a procurement by procurement basis. Yeah, yeah, certainly moving I think some of the, the messages we've, we've hopefully tried to get across is that um, the circular economy um, is an important part of the net zero and the carbon reduction agenda. That's um, emphasized in the, um, the procurement, the Scottish procurement policy note that was issued not too long ago. Um, so it's, it's, it's understood that circular economy is a key part of this. Um, sometimes there's an, uh, there's an assumption that the circular economy is all about waste. It's all about reducing waste. Uh, it's, a, it's a bit more than that. Um, it, it, it could be getting organisations, suppliers to think of how they design products. It could be about um, um, how you design services which use materials or products. There's a lot of opportunities to get reduction in carbon. Um, it may not be, in some cases, influencing or impacting on scope one or scope two, it might be influencing those scope three emissions. Um, but it is an important element because ultimately, as we've seen with some of the examples, it could save you money. It uh, could generate local jobs and skills, which are particularly important particularly following the pandemic. Um, and, and it also improves resilience. If we, if we are 
particularly reliant on uh, imports for a lot of our products. Uh, we need to reduce that reliance. It, uh, if we reduce that reliance, we improve um, the focus on net zero, reduce emissions anyway, and we make um, more local jobs. We create more local jobs and skills, which is obviously important. So the circular economy, as Mervyn said at the beginning, the circular approach to procurement is, while it's an extension of sustainable procurement, it is it is a way of delivering the localization agenda, the, um, the net zero agenda, climate reduction agenda. Um, so it's, it's trying to capture all of those. Um, it's not dealing with some of the other sustainable procurement issues, which are obviously relevant, um, be they ethical trade necessarily, which is a particular issue concerned within the HEFE sector, of course. Um, but it is it is a, a focus on circularity. If you do if you do it well, and hopefully we've emphasised the point um, when Mervyn was talking about early stage consideration and the eight stages, and the fact that five of those stages are really to do with pretender. That's the critical element, the critical stages. If you get it right early, then everything flows, everything cascades. If you leave it to the last minute after you develop your specification and your tender and you try and tack it on at the end, um, you're not going to achieve a great deal. So a lot of this can, can appear to be quite challenging um, because you are encouraging rethinking of what you've done in the past, perhaps, uh, rethinking what you bought in the past. But hopefully we've seen that there are significant benefits to be had if that approach is taken. Yeah, if you've got any questions, by the way, please put them into the chat. Um, otherwise, this just becomes a head-to-head a -head act between Philip and myself. Um, and obviously, if you've, got, if you've got any case study examples as well, you know, it's things that you're yeah. doing that either demonstrate some of the points we've made or, you know, any, any comments about problems that you've encountered, please put those into the chat. Um, one of the things I'm going to, while we're waiting for some of those questions to come in, one of the things I am going to do is pick up on a point Philip made about, um, you know, fair and ethical social value. Um, what I have seen in my role in terms of supporting the public sector in, in Scotland, the UK, and also more widely in Europe on European projects is often uh, an ending up a seemingly artificial competition between social and sustainable um, and, and I think not only is that bad for business but it also doesn't recognize what the definition of sustainability is it's economic social and environmental linked together if one of those legs of that stool is longer than the other then unless you're on a hillside you're going to fall over so it's about balancing those economic social and environmental needs and, and it's not about competing so um, without naming names, you know, when I've spoken to organisations and to procurers who are saying, oh, we're doing that because we've got social value indicators in, you know, that's not necessarily saying the same as are we actually looking to use procurement to reduce our carbon footprint, to close material loops and to create other environmental benefits alongside the social benefits. It's trying to think about the two, environment, social and also the economic, the cost effectiveness argument as a balancing act, as an integrated approach. So yeah, it's it's not a competition. Um, yeah, over to you, Phil. No questions so far. So either what we're saying makes complete sense or what we're saying is, well, I think, um, yeah. I think we assume that's the case, certainly. Um, okay, well, um, tomorrow obviously we'll be focusing on um, a bit more of the practical stuff. Um, okay, today has been more conceptual but it's important to, to be clear, we will be revisiting some of this. We'll be looking at the hierarchy and applying that in practice. And we'll be talking about a few more examples. Uh, we would encourage, as Mervyn said, to, for you to you know, feed us with any examples you've got. What have you actually done? Because some of this has been a circular economy and circular procurement isn't necessarily a brand new thing. It's been around for many years. Okay, it's now 
got a new term, if you like. Um, and that can sometimes strike, put the fear of God into people because there's a, you just got to used to the term sustainable procurement and then another term called circular procurement comes along. Well, as we say, don't, you know, it's not something different. It is part of, it's an extension of sustainable procurement. And you may well have been doing some of this for some years. There's been reuse of aggregates, for example, in construction for many years. That has become norm. Um, there has been um, some element of reuse and repair services for furniture and other products for some years. Um, what we're trying to do is say, well, there are more opportunities to do this. There are ways of extending the reach and the scope of this into uh, it's becoming increasingly important because of the focus on net zero and climate reduction uh, and also the need to to be more resilient in our supply chain so if you've got examples uh, which you may not even think are actually circular procurement but if you if you think about how you've sought to reduce waste or you've sought to think about recycled content or extend the useful life of products or materials or assets in some way, um, then it's, it's a good idea to share them uh, so that we can uh, have a discussion about them tomorrow. Uh, and also we'll share them with, with others um, after, the, after the session tomorrow. Yeah, Sean, uh, I think she's left the meeting now, but Sean had asked, would be interested to know if a quick turnaround in recent tenders, thinking about actions to make estates safer for staff and students may have helped or hindered. Again, um, it, this, it's quite a complex answer to that because it, it depends on whether those materials and those products are being called off on frameworks, in which case um, those products, are, you know, to, to an extent, will already be covered by the sustainability and the circular elements within the frameworks. Scottish Excel um, and Bill have, and Zero Waste Scotland have been doing a lot in recent frameworks to ensure that broader circular um, you know, making things last uh, are incorporated into the selection of suppliers on frameworks. However, if it's just calling off, um, you know, in terms of direct tenders from the marketplace, then, you know, again, the importance there is to ensure that the sustainability specifications are still part and parcel of those tenders. Um, you know, it's, it's not an excuse to step backwards. It's not an excuse to to downgrade the specification just simply because of expediency of time. Uh, there are products and there are plenty of products out there on the market that can deliver both rapidly and also sustainably at the same time. Um, and uh, Avril, Avril asked about um, case studies for printing MFDs. Short answer is yes, there are quite a few of those around. Uh, there is a new platform called Circular and Fair ICT or CFIT that was launched last week at the World Circular Economy Forum. This is a, a global platform that incorporates not just the suppliers, but also the potential buyers, you know, to, to create a, a more consistent approach to the marketplace at a global level for ICT. Um, HP are one of those um, associates of that and HP have done an awful lot of work in terms of recycled content in plastic in devices but also in terms of their toner inks and their cartridges and there are of course many other manufacturers and suppliers available as well as uh, HP so it's not a plug just for them but that's one that springs to mind Lenovo uh, and others um, Dell they, they, they've all been doing different things a lot focusing on the housings and the casings, um, you know, chemicals of concern, the flame retardants and the plasticizers within casings and housings, but also when we're talking about multifunctional devices, about the ink, um, you know, and vegetable based inks now, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, there are examples out there. Uh, I haven't got the ability to, to, to give you links yet, Avril, but I'm sure we can do that as part of the resource slide at the end when we follow up. Okay. Okay. How to tackle suppliers in terms of inbuilt obsolescence, Phil? Sorry, what was that one? How to tackle suppliers in terms of inbuilt obsolescence? Uh, are we talking about inbuilt obsolescence of products or equipment? Well, I it's planned obsolescence. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. Well, it's a, it's a good question. Um, 
Uh, how long have we got? Not long. Um, there are there are lots of examples where this applies, and part of, part of it comes down to cost and what we're prepared to pay. Um, now it's not necessarily an HEFE example, but there was an example we were looking at last year, which was to do with walking aids, frames and crutches and stuff like that. They are and obviously very relevant for the NHS, but that they cost so little to buy. You know, you can get a set of crutches for seven quid. Um, if there is therefore no financial incentive to um, make them, um, to, to reuse them, to recycle them. Okay, there's some work that does take place. So the, the model at the moment is to make them cheap, make them have a relatively short warranty period and therefore design for some obsolescence after the end of that warranty period. Um, and, uh, and therefore you just replace them, you buy some new stuff. Um, ideally, what we want is to be able to reuse all of them. So at the moment, you're having to spend lots of time and potentially money trying to extract them from the community and reuse. Now, okay, it's not a specific HEFE example, but it's an example of obsolescence. So to some extent, we have to ask the question, what are we prepared to pay um, to have something that will last longer? And that needs to be part of our financial modeling or life cycle costing analysis. Um, it needs to take into account the environmental impacts as well as the, um, the, the, the physical cost of buying these products. Um, but also to, I think, to, to, to remember that things like type one eco labels, you know, uh, yeah. transparency yeah. of information, asking for product data sheets. You know, um, if you know that a washing machine only has 1500 cycles and it costs 200 quid, and another one, as Phil's just said, you know, might look like it, it, it's far more expensive at 1200 pounds or whatever, but has a 20 year lifetime guarantee, um, you know, and operates for over 30,000 cycles. That's when you know having that whole life picture enables you then to have the information, and, and the eco labels uh, are one way of demonstrating that. But product data sheets are another. You know, the functional life of ICT is often limited not by the physical hardware but by the software. So again, yeah, it's it's those sorts of things that you can look at in in terms of understanding both through market dialogue, but also then through asking suppliers then to provide that information at the point of tender. Yeah. Okay, Mervyn, thank you. Um, we are just about at the end of time. So um, just to wrap up, I think, what next? <coughs> um, this slide is just reinforcing, <coughs> excuse me, some of the key points we made. Make sure you understand what your ambitions are. Make sure you understand what the benefits are of being ambitious or you know, what your according to your particular ambitions. <coughs> Consider this early. Make sure you get the right people involved early enough uh, collaborating internally, externally, uh, talk to the market. The market can do a lot of this um, or will need to understand what your ambitions are so that they can adjust their business model accordingly. That was certainly the lesson from examples that we've spoken about today. Um, are there sample projects? Think about you, any you want to crop up tomorrow in discussion, uh, any questions in chat, um, think about that for tomorrow. And have you got any pilots that you think would be a good idea um, going forward? You know, where can you start from if you're already, if this is a, a, an early stage for you? Um, think about the complexity, think about lifetime, etc. And of course, share ideas, keep talking, share ideas with us tomorrow, but also with colleagues uh, and others outside of uh, your organisation. So uh, tomorrow, specifying, um, so we will welcome you again at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Thank you very much for attending today. Um, if there are no final points, we'll keep looking at chat and seeing if there's anything else we've, we've missed, and we'll try and touch on those tomorrow if we haven't done it today. So um, otherwise, thank you very much, and uh, we will see you tomorrow. Yeah. Um, before we do that, there's a list of resources. We'll remind you about these tomorrow again. Uh, we may be tweaking them of the list slightly by the end of tomorrow, but uh, there's some useful resources there. Thank you, everybody. See you tomorrow. Thank you very much. Have a good day. <laughs>